big R quantity squared. That's parabolic. So now we know if it's laminar flow in a tube, the flow profile, the velocity profile, will be parabolic. The next step we did last time was to get the flow rate Q. We integrate over the velocity U times the differential area. We talked about that last time, what that was. I think it was pi d l, uh, yeah, the differential area. It was our, uh, like this. There's our dA. There's another area. We've got a circular area, pi r squared. We've got the circular <coughs> area. Then we've got the differential area looking at the pipeline straight on, head on. This is the radius r. So circumference times dr, and dr is the thickness. Circumference 2 pi r, so the differential area 2 pi r dr. Okay, so anyway, we integrated that from the center line, r equals zero, out to the outside radius. Here's the picture. The outside radius goes to here, capital R. Okay. When you do that, you end up with this equation. This is this equation. Okay, I think that's about where we left off last time. Uh, now, the uh, next step. Yeah, I think we did, I did this two last time. Did we get VC equal to 2V last time? Yeah, okay. So, what we said last time was since uh, V equal Q over A, we put that Q up there divide it by the area, pi big R squared, and we get the average velocity delta P D squared over 32 mu L. And then we note when we, we did this last time too, we compared that to VC, that the average velocity was just VC over two. <coughs> Okay, that's I think where we stopped off last time. Now we're going to solve this guy here for delta P. We're going to divide this by one half rho b squared. That back in chapter three, yeah, chapter three, that was called the dynamic pressure. One half rho b squared. So divide that guy by one half rho b squared. And when you do that, this is what you uh, end up with. number is rho v d over mu.
Now, here's delta P multiplied through by one half rho B squared over two. That's that one. There's L over D. This thing, this was a definition. This is a definition. We define F by this equation. This F is called the friction factor. So if we want to find the pressure drop in a pipe, we can take the length, divide it by the pipe diameter, multiply it by the density of the fluid flowing, multiply it by the average velocity squared, divided by two, and times a factor, which we call the friction factor. Now, if it's laminar flow, you can see in laminar flow what F is. There's F. So for laminar flow, F equals 64 over the Reynolds number. Now, friction factor is dimensionless. Dimensions. So that's important to know. And again, the friction factor is something we've invented. We define it. Why do we invent it? Because it makes it easy to calculate the pressure drop in a pipe with this concept of a friction factor. And laminar flow is very simple. 64 divided by the Reynolds number. Now, uh, we can also divide this by uh, rho, rho g. So divide this guy <coughs> by rho g. Uh, so our rho g is gamma. So we have delta p over gamma is equal to F L over D. The rows cancel out. The G's downstairs. V squared over 2G. Units are feet are meters. And we now call that the head loss due to friction. The head loss due to friction. And where do we use that? Um, that's the equal sign there. We use that, of course, in the energy equation from chapter five. Okay, the energy equation, chapter five. things to happen. For instance, that's the head developed by the pump. This is the head developed by the turbine. This L stands for the length of a piece of pipe. This is the head loss due to pipe friction. This is called the minor losses due to elbows and fittings and valves. They're all, this is called the head form of the energy equation because every term has units of feet or meters. 
this HL now, we used to say this was called the losses. Just called the losses, L-O-S-S-E-S, -S -S. we called it that. Now we've got a way to find the losses. There it is. I've got to find, though, the friction factor. That's the key. I know how long the pipe is. I know its diameter. If somebody gives me the flow rate, I can find the velocity. But it comes down to finding F. So that's what it amounts to. We have to find F. And if we have laminar flow, it's very easy. There's the equation for, uh, for F. OK, let's work an example problem in using that. By the way, the reason why we write the energy equation like that on the right-hand side of the board is because everything on the left-hand side is energy that's come, like coming into the fluid. The subscript 1 means entering. A pump does what? Adds energy. So the fluid brings in energy. The pump adds more energy. Now, where does that energy go? Some of it goes out with the fluid leaving. There it is. A turbine can take energy out. That's what a turbine does. Losses, of course, reduce the energy available. Minor losses, of course, reduce the energy available. So that's why it's nice to write that equation in that form. Because you can then talk about it in words and not just in symbols like that. OK, so our example then, um, horizontal pipe. What if we had a horizontal pipe? A horizontal pipe of constant diameter. A horizontal pipe of constant diameter, incompressible flow. Continuity, incompressible. V1, V2, same. Horizontal pipe, Z1, Z2, OK. We're left with what? P1 is clear in P2. Yeah, pressure is high coming in. Delta P divided by gamma equal, if there's no, if there's no pump, goodbye. If there's no turbine, goodbye. If we neglect minor losses, gone. Then, and only then, do we get that guy. Okay. That's where it comes from down there, just so you know where it came from. That equation there is valid for what again? Incompressible, horizontal pipe, no pumps, no turbines, neglect minor losses. If, if that's not true, go back up there. That H sub L is still the same thing. But you don't have this equation. See this equation right here? H sub L equal delta gamma. That's where it comes from. So just be careful when you use that guy. That's that thing's always true. That thing is always true. This thing is sometimes true. When's the sometime? Oh, here we go again. No pumps, no turbines, neglect minor losses, and incompressible horizontal pipe. Okay. So this example is incompressible horizontal pipe. Oil, specific gravity 0.85. Okay, viscosity, kinematic viscosity. Fifteen centimeter diameter pipe. At a flow rate Q zero two zero cubic meters per second. I want to find head loss. in 100 meter length of pipe. Okay. There it is, head loss. Head loss, H sub L. It's horizontal, incompressible, constant diameter. There it is. H, and no pumps, no turbines, no minor losses, H sub L. Delta P over uh, gamma. 
which is F L over D. B squared over 2G. First of all, pretty much always in a fluid problem flow in a pipe or a tube or a duct, always calculate the Reynolds number. You have to know that to start with. V D over nu. Okay, let's get the uh, velocity up here. The velocity is uh, Q over A. So we have 0.020. Divided by the uh, area pi over 4 d squared, diameter 15 centimeters, velocity 1.13 meters per second. Okay, 1.13. Now, if you want to, you can you could use the uh, we had an equation uh, which was in terms of q for the Reynolds number. You could do that too. That's, that's a shortcut way to do it, really. But I found the velocity first. I'll need it, I think, maybe later on. We'll see. Uh, times the diameter. Diameter is 15 centimeters. Divided by kinematic viscosity, given 6 times 10 to the minus 4. So the um, Reynolds number, 283. Less than 2100, so it's laminar. Okay, so now we know, yep, okay, laminar flow. Once I know that, now I can get the friction factor. Friction factor, 64 over the Reynolds number. Friction factor, 0.226. Now I plug it into the delta P equation. F226, the length of the pipe, 100 meters. The diameter of the pipe, 0.15 meters. Yeah, I need V squared. Uh, v, 1.13 squared. Divided by 2G, 9.83. meters. That's, uh, you, what happened to the, uh, to gamma? It just popped up again, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so <coughs> order flow. That's how we get that. Now we take a little more difficult one, because most of the flows in the real world are not laminar. Most of them are turbulent. So now you've got to figure out a way to get the turbulent pressure drop in the pipe. <coughs> OK. Well, let's, um, I think I'll put it over here. By the way, this equation is still going to hold whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. The only thing we can't do is this guy right here. Because he came from here, and he came from here, and he came from here. I I erased part of that. And it came from Newton's law of viscosity. So this is the one we cannot use for turbulent flow. But this equation is still true. This equation is still true, except now we need F for turbulent flow. Let's just review real quick laminar and turbulent flow. Laminar flow, pretty much, if you follow a fluid particle as it moves down in a laminar flow field, it pretty much is straight. Now, if you go to a turbulent flow field, particle might, if you greatly exaggerate it, just to show you on the board, that's what it does. See, the word laminar comes from lamina. What a lamina mean? Lamina means flat surfaces. A laminate 
flooring for your kitchen or whatever. It's a flat surface. Uh, a textbook, these pages are like lamina. They can slide over each other very smoothly. They slide over each other. That's lamina. So the fluid molecules pretty much go in a U direction, X direction, the U velocity. And they don't hit each other too much. They go straight like this. They don't hit each other too much. Now, when you get the turbulent flow, you get a little V component of velocity. Don't forget, U goes this way, V goes normal to it. You get a little V component. So this molecule starts to bounce around like this as they go down. They're bouncing like this. And of course, two cars in a freeway, one guy going like this, one going like this. Guess <laughs> what happens? Metal on metal. Friction slows the car down. Guess what happens to the molecules in the water? They bump into each other, they exchange momentum, and friction develops, and they start to slow down. This is rougher, it's, it's, it's more, more reaction. So that's what's happening here. There is a V component of velocity in turbulent flow as opposed to a nice smooth flow in laminar flow. Okay, let's get on the turbulent flow a bit. Uh, turbulent flow. They, to get the F values, they didn't go to any theoretical derivation like we did for lambda flow. No, you, it's very, very difficult, nearly impossible. So what they did is um, they took pipes, as described in here, they, they took pipes and they different diameters, and they glued sand on the inside surface of the pipe. Now they glued very precise diameter sand particles, not random sand particles, very precise diameter sand particles onto the inside of a pipe to go to a rougher and rougher pipe. And then they made the flow turbulent, and then they looked at the results of this pipe roughness. So they artificially roughened the inside surface of the pipe with sand particles and glue. Imagine that. What a job that was for some of our graduate students. <laughs> you got his you know, tuition paid for it, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, yeah, that's what they did. Now, now that they didn't then get an equation. What they did is, is they took all that data and different people massaged it and worked with it. And they ended up with something called the Moody diagram. Now, here's what the Moody diagram is plotting. On the y-axis, they're plotting the friction factor F. And I'm going to give you one in a minute, but I'll just jump around the board now. So if you want to copy them, you have to. I have your own copy. Anyway, that's the friction factor. And this is the um, Reynolds number. So maybe what I'll do is give it to you now so you can look at it. OK, I got one? All right. Um, again, bring this back with you on Wednesday. So there's a Moody. <coughs> uh, I'm going to just sketch on the board again and mention some things about it. We're plotting F on the uh, x-axis. It starts down there at 0.008 and it goes up to uh, 0 0.10. Uh, this is 0 0.01. Yeah, okay. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's 0 0.05. Reynolds number, uh, 10 squared, I'll just start at 10 squared, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Laminar flow, out there uh, roughly less than 2100. Here's 100. Now th this is a log, log axis, first of all. Log, log axis. Both axes are log, log. So, 
here's a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, million. Okay. So lambda flow twenty one hundred, two thousand. Okay, ten thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. About there. Twenty one hundred. In that region, in laminar flow, the friction factor is 64 over Reynolds number. When you plot that on log, log axes, that's a power law. Plot it on log, log axes, guess what? You get a straight line. Okay, there it is. Here down to about 0 0.03. So there's the line F equals 64 over the Reynolds number, laminar flow. But now you see another family of lines, and they start out up here at about 0 0.03, and this, this is four, roughly 4,000. So this is 4,000. And these lines go something like this. I'm just going to sketch them like this. And these lines are labeled on the right-hand axes. You can either say little e or epsilon, take your choice. I'll use little e. E over d, the relative roughness, e over d. These lines are e over d. This guy is called the pipe roughness. This one, of course, is the pipe diameter. Where do you get the pipe roughness? In the little legend. In the little legend, it says, if the pipe is cast iron, or galvanized iron, or drawn tubing, or concrete, here's the value of little e. So they give you the value of little e for different pipe materials. Notice concrete, really, really rough compared to a wrought iron pipe. Of course concrete's rough. Take your hand and wipe your hand on it. You know, it's not good, it feels rough. Now take your hand on a PVC pipe, rub along the PVC pipe. Wow, is it smooth. Copper, wow, is it smooth. This line here is labeled the smooth pipe line. Good uh, PVC can be approximated most of the time as smooth. Drawn copper tubing can be approximated most of the time as uh, smooth. There's a, a little bit beyond that they call it hydraulically smooth. So, but normally in this class, if, if you hear something like PVC or copper, look at drawn tubing. Oh my gosh, what are there, six zeros and a five feet? Yeah, it's really pretty smooth. So yeah, we're going to assume a pipe like that is smooth, yeah. So how'd they get those lines like that? Now don't forget, they got, they got this one over here. They got this one from theory. These guys, they didn't get from theory. They got from doing what? Gluing sand particles very carefully on the inside of a tube. And the, the bigger the sand particles were, the rougher the tube was. This is high roughness. This is no roughness. So if we want to get F in turbulent flow, to put this equation right here, or up here, Then we have to get the relative roughness, divide it by the diameter, find what line we're on, get the Reynolds number, go up here with the Reynolds number until you find out what line you're on, then go across horizontally until you get to the f-axis, and that's the value of the friction factor. Okay.
Now, let's see. Just for your own information, I, I gave you three examples on the bottom of that page with uh, a Moody chart on it to make sure you're reading the Moody chart correctly. One is for a galvanized iron pipe, one's for a riveted steel pipe, other one's for a drawn tubing pipe. And I got the points labeled there to show you on the movie chart where those points are to give you the friction factor in the left-hand side of the page there. So that's examples of how you get the friction factor. Okay. This is called, now, you can see where it starts to be flat. It starts to be flat out here. There, you can draw a dashed line here. This is where it starts to be flat. Everything to the right of that dashed line, these lines are horizontal. Horizontal. This region is labeled in our textbook, completely turbulent. The region, that's to that side of the line. The region from here to here is labeled transition. The transition region between these two dashed lines. Transition region. The region from here to here, of course, laminar. The region between these two guys, from here to here, critical. So there are four regions of the Moody diagram. Four regions of the Moody diagram. You wouldn't need the Moody diagram for laminar flow because it's, it's don't ever use the Moody diagram for laminar flow. Do it mathematically, 64 divided by Reynolds number. No, you should read in that log log chart. But where you need it is over here, of course. Or you could find some curve fit equation that might work to get F as a function of different things. Okay, so let's say you're in uh, the laminar region. F depends on the Reynolds number only. Let's say you're in a completely turbulent region. F depends on E over D only. If I'm in one pipe right here, that value of F won't change along here where it's horizontal. And what's that region called where it's horizontal? The completely turbulent region. Now take the transition. F depends on, okay, now it depends on Reynolds and E over D. Okay. It depends on both things, the Reynolds number and the relative roughness. E over D is called the relative roughness. It's dimensionless. F is dimensionless. The Reynolds number is dimensionless. This is a dimensionless chart. We engineers love dimensionless charts. In fluid mechanics and heat transfer, wow, there must be 25 or 30 dimensionless parameters. The Nussault number, the Stanton number, the Weber number, 
the Poisson number, the Reynolds number, blah, 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 the friction factor, the relative roughness, those are all dimensionless uh, parameters. So this is, the, this is a dimensionless chart plotted on log log paper. Sometimes people have a lot of difficulty reading a log log axis. So if this is 10 squared and this is 10 and this is 10 cubed, okay, find 105. Reynolds number, 105. Because if you can't read this axis, you're not going to get the F value right. 105. What's this one? 100. What's that one? 10. What's that one? 1,000. Now, don't say this. I think 100 and I think that's 500. No, no. <coughs> Here's what it is. If you take the distance from here to here, take a ruler and measure this distance, and take 70% of it, you got that? 70% of it. That's what 500 is. Don't think linearly, think logarithmically. That's how the scale's made from log. There, there's 500. It's not in the middle. No, it's 70% of the distance between my two fingers. That's where you put the 5 times 10 squared. That, by the way, is 5 times 10 squared. Where is 9 times 10 squared? There. Where is 2 times 10 squared? There. What's that? 200. Where's 105? Right there. And boy, you better read those guys right. It, it's not rocket science, you know. It's not calculus, no. Not the BQ, no. It's how do you read a log scale reasonably, reasonably accurate. So be careful. You know, some people, when they, when they get numbers like this, they really have a problem reading those scales in your hand. Okay, let's go back to here then. It is, it is serious, oh, it's big time serious on a smooth pipe. Very steep curve, very steep curve. If you're off reading this guy down, some people think, Okay, uh, 110,000. Uh, 1.1 times 10 to the fifth. There's two times 10 to the fifth. Okay, right there. There it is, right there. So be careful. It can really get you if you're not careful. All right. I didn't do the critical region yet. I didn't do critical region. No, I didn't do it, and I'm not going to do it. Look at the Moody chart. What do you see there? I see a blank region. There's nothing there. The line's end. That's right. The line's end. Well, what does that mean? That means don't even attempt to get a friction factor in the critical region. Well, what if I design something that's in the critical region? I say, well, you should have been an accountant then. Maybe a graphic artist. I don't know. But you're not an engineer. No engineer designed something to operate in the critical region. And guess why? Because to the left is laminar flow, and to the right is turbulent flow. <laughs> and since we don't know where we are, your neck is on the chopping block. Don't say, well, I think it might be laminar. Or, you know, I'm pretty sure it's turbulent. What does pretty sure mean, I think mean? It means you're in trouble. No, it just means we engineers don't design anything to operate in that region. Now, we know we've got to go past it to get from no flow, when you turn the pump on, no flow, you're going to be turbulent. We, we go past it, but we don't sit there on it. We don't design something to sit there because we don't know what's happening. As, as a, for instance, the flow could be laminar in a pipe, in, in a factory, in a plant, in a pipe. And then his, the pipes are attached to the four bolts. And, and over there, 20 feet away, is a, a, a big compressor. Big compressor. <clears throat> the compressor doesn't operate continuously. It goes on when the pressure of the air goes down in the line. The compressor kicks on. The floor starts to vibrate. Mm -hmm. Guess what happens? You're running the risk of tripping that laminar flow into turbulent flow just because the compressor went on. Which means you, the engineer, don't know what's going to happen. 
So the lesson is, don't design anything near that region. Stay away. Say, I'm going to make it exactly 2,100. Oh, man. You're really, you're really, that's, don't, don't do that. That's not a magic number. Four textbooks, our heat transfer book says 2,300. Some textbooks say 2,000. Some textbooks say 2,100. There's no magic number. It's around 2,100, plus or minus a couple hundred. So, you know, don't, don't think it at magically at 2,100, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kick off to critical. No, 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 no. Or is 4,000 magic? No, it's not magic. Now, here's the rule book. In our class, yes, yeah, magic number. If you get it on an exam, 2,050, OK, it's laminar flow. You get 4,001, it's turbulent flow. So in our class, yeah, they're magic numbers. In the real world, no, they're not magic. They're negotiable. Where's your pipe? Inside the plant, outside the plant? How close is it to, to a diesel engine? Blah, 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 things like that. OK. Now, let's see, that's, so that's our turbulent. Here's, here's what it depends on. Now, there are various uh, fit equations to fit that data. Uh, some are more accurate than others. We're going to use one equation that fits that data. And uh, it's called the modified Colburn equation. So um, this is for our entire nonlinear or non lambda partner. You can use the uh, Cobra. formula. It's called the modified Colbrook. Sometimes called the Halen equation, but we'll call it the modified Colbrook. 1 over square root f. Because you can't put the Moody chart on some kind of a computer code, obviously. you got to put an equation. Minus 1.8 log to the base 10, d over d, 3.7. Let's just make it simpler. So you can use this to calculate F. It's a uh, textual calculation, obviously. And that works anywhere to the right of my piece of paper. Anywhere to the right of my piece of paper. If um, e over d, if it's a smooth pipe, then of course the roughness is zero in there. Okay. Oh, and uh, our textbook tells you. I'll, I'll, I'll read it here. Okay. A word of caution is in order concerning the use of the Moody chart or the equivalent formulas. Because of various inherent inaccuracies involving, involved, uncertainty in relative roughness, uncertainty experimental data to produce a Moody chart, the use of several place accuracy in pipe flow problems is usually not justified. As a rule of thumb, a 10% accuracy is the best expected. That's the best. 
goes downhill from there. So the best you can get by reading the Moody chart or using the equation is within 10% of the actual one. And of course, that's only for brand new pipe. If the pipe's been in the line for five years, oh, all bets are off. The roughness has increased dramatically because of hard water deposits on the inside of the pipe, for instance, your home, your pipes in your home. Hard water in the western region of the US. Oh yeah. And what does that do? Deposits calcium, makes the surface really rough, and it makes the opening smaller and smaller with time as you get more and more calcium. So yeah, that's a big, big problem. This is only for designing new pipes. Okay. Now, look, look at the friction factor for laminar flow. Is that equation valid um, for oil? Of course it is. Water? Yeah. Air? Mm -hmm. Carbon dioxide? Yeah. A one inch pipe? Sure. Six inch pipe? Yeah. Rectangular duct? HVAC duct? Uh -huh. 30 foot water pipe? Yeah. Okay. Is it valid for PVC? Yeah. Is it valid for cast iron? Uh huh. Concrete? Yeah. You get the point. There, there's not a special equation for different diameters of oh, different flow rates. Flow rate 2 gallons per minute, 10 gallons per minute, 30 gallons per minute. Does it work for all that? Yeah, it works for all that. No matter what the pipe's made out of. Well, you know, here's a Reynolds number. Here's what the Reynolds number is. First of all, it's a function of the pipe diameter. Second of all, it's a function of the flow rate. Third of all, it's a function of what the fluid is. Those are the three things that the uh, Friction factor, it runs on, it depends on. So, there, there's only one, there's only one equation for everything. Now you go to turbulent flow. Uh, now I add one more parameter, this dimensionless thing, E over D, to that one. So now you tell me what kind of pipe it is. Stainless steel. Okay, I get E over D. Tell me its its flow rate, 100 gallons per minute. Okay, I got V now. Two inch pipe, got it. What's it carrying, water? Got it. So I know everything I need. What kind of pipe it is, what's its diameter, what's the flow rate, what's the fluid. Based on that, I can go over here and I can find the friction factor. Now, you know, is there 10,000 sheets of paper? It, 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 let's see, I'm, I'm trying to find stainless steel, oh here it is. Now I'm trying to find stainless steel two inch diameter. Uh, there's a movie chart for that too, there, right there. No, there's not 10,000 sheets of paper, one for each fluid, one for each diameter, one for each flow rate. No, 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 no. Guess how many sheets of paper I need to give you the friction factor for any pipe material, any pipe flow rate, any fluid in the pipe. I'll tell you. One. I wish I'd invented it. Bill diagram. I love the sound of that. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't do it. Uh, Professor Moody did that back then. So, yeah. Now, people don't realize that. that. Are you kidding me? One sheet of paper? The friction factor for everything us engineers can imagine? That's why everybody graduating from a fluids class better know the Moody diagram. Everybody graduating from an ME218 materials. What should they know about a certain diagram? The so what? Or stress stress What's the one with the circle? What? More circle? You got it. You got it. <laughs> are there equations to do that? Are there equations to do that? Yes, there are. Why do we still teach the more circle then? Because we engineers love the visual impact of a diagram like that. And, and why don't we just use, use the equations? Because the equation came from that. So number one, you should learn how to read this. And this is just then what you put on your computer program to solve for that. But that diagram, 
oh, it's, and we just say, well, isn't that beautiful? I just love that diagram. You know, that's the way we are. We're that kind of people. Now, the math people say, oh, look at that equation. I love that equation. I know. I love them, too. They're good people. But they're not engineers, okay? We love other things later. That's why I love that Woody diagram. Everything is on that thing. And what kind of diagram is that? That's called a dimensionless diagram. We engineers love dimensionless numbers. You don't, you don't, you don't plot the flow right here, the velocity. You, you don't plot the, the diameter. It's all divided by different things here and here. And F, dimensionless. That equation right there is a dimensionless equation. Nothing has dimensions. Okay. So that's, that's the diagram that you want to use to get the friction factors for homework and other, other problems. Uh, you'll have one on the, on the final exam. So you'll have that in your hands for that. Okay. Um, I think a good stopping point. Now, what we're, next time we're going to bring in, here it is, we're going to bring in this guy in. Next time we're going to discuss the minor losses.